We're doing Parsha's Noah, beginning on page 30. Sadly, we very rarely ever come across a time that we can do Parsha's Bereshis, because mm -hmm. we do it so quickly, right after Simplus Torah. This year we did it really quickly after Simplus Torah, since it was the next day. So we'll have to start with, uh, with Noah, and make do next year, hopefully it'll be a bit different. So Parsha's Noah begins, Eile told us Noah, these are the generations of Noah, Noah ish tzadik tamim haya of Noah, he was a man who was righteous, uh, who was complete, and uh, he was uh, fulfilli, fulfilled uh, in his generation. Es ha'elokim hisalik Noah, and with God walked Noah. So the commentaries have a lot to say about this statement. The first one is, we're talking about Noah. So the, uh, no, who was Noah? So it tells you Noah was a righteous and a, a tamim person, a perfect person um, in his generation. And with God, he walked. So there's a ma many questions that I brought up here. First thing is, what, what are all these names? He is a man who is righteous and he is complete. And then it wants to know about, it says, but he was in his generation. Would he have been that in other generations? Or was he only righteous in his generation? Um, and then it says he walked with God. Right? So does that mean that, that God was alongside him? Was God in front of him, behind him? What does that mean that he walked with God since God doesn't walk anywhere? Now what is it telling us? So there's a number of messages here. Some of them are conflicting, but they all seem to be um, important and things that we can learn from it. I think the first thing that we, that we can learn from this, uh, the commentaries here don't directly say this, but the Eilid told us Noah, who was Noah? Noah was East Tzadik Tamim. He was a, a man who was righteous and he was perfect. However, the commentaries, right, they talk about the idea that he was, he was righteous and he was perfect and what that means. Well, we have a good idea. But um, I noticed one person who said that, that you'll notice before he gives all of these superlatives, all of these, these commentary on, on his personality, first it says ish, he's a man. And this is not a insignificant thing that they add this word. Because you could say Noah, right, Noah was a tzaddik and tamim. You don't have to say he was a man who was a tzaddik and tamim. We know he's a man. He's masculine. We know that. So why do they tell us this? Um, you see the same thing by Moshe. Moshe is called Ish Elohim, a man of God. Right? You're always referred to as uh, by his gender and then by what he is. And, and I believe that it's telling us an important thing, and I saw this in the writings of Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky. He says that the reason it tells you man first is that before Noah could be referred to as righteous, and before Noah could be referred to as, as perfect, and before Moshe could be called uh, the, uh, first an Ish Mitzri, the man who was uh, Egyptian, and then later Ish Elohim, the man of God, you have to first be a man. That is, you have to be a mensch. Before you are able to become extraordinary, right, and become like a perfect person, a righteous person, the first step towards that, the foundation of that is being a mensch, being a person who does things in an appropriate manner. Right? It doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily talking about mitzvahs here. In other words, of course we're a person who do, does mitzvahs, and that's what tzaddik has, refers to. But here it's telling you that there are areas that are not necessarily mitzvahs. And these are the areas that, that makes a person a mensch. Like um, an example that I've given before, and I'll, I'll be doing it again over the weekend, is that, um, is that I, I have an acquaintance who's a dental hygienist, and she tells me that people you know, come from our community, not specifically our community, but from the Jewish community and the religious community, go to, um, they go to her. And they, you know, they have schedules, of, and she says that basically, as a hygienist, I schedule 20-minute segments. If somebody is n normally, like in the one, one or two, there'll be 20 minutes or 40 minutes. If somebody needs extra work, I'll do 60 minutes. But what happens is, is that some of these people, they come to me, <clears throat> and they have absolutely no issue in... <clears throat> excuse me, they have no issue in coming late. And they can come 20 minutes late, which means that I've used their entire appointment to be gone by the time they come. But then they come and they expect that, that they'll be taken care of. And of course they will be taken care of. But what it does now is it throws off everybody else after them. Now, does it say in the Torah somewhere, is there a mitzvah that says you have to be on time? Is there any, like the Torah doesn't say if you make an appointment with your dental hygienist, you have to be on time. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Torah. Is that the Torah doesn't have such an idea, but this concept is what's called being a mensch. If you, if you, you have to realize that somebody else's time is important. 
my time is important, your time is important. Right? Uh, uh, nobody wants to have to go somewhere and sit around. Right? Right? You don't want to go to the doctor and wait for an hour. You don't want to go to, um, to anywhere, right? to go to a, a, a government office or to visit with somebody or an appointment with someone and have to wait. Nobody wants to have to do that. A couple of minutes we can understand, but to have to wait a long time is really something that we don't like. And therefore, when we are late at something because you know, whatever reason we choose, we're throwing off somebody else's schedule and could be a schedule of many people after us because we're doing that. What happens is, so you say, well, it doesn't say in the Torah that I've got to be on time. But the fact is, if you want to be at Sadiq, maybe you could be late, but you won't be a mensch. If you want to be a, a good person, you have to take care of and think about other people's things that are important to them, be it their time, their money, right, their life. So pe people, we can't be cavalier with other people's time or other people's money. We have to take that very seriously. And um, that's an example of what it says here when it says that, Mo that Noah was at each. First, before we talk about him being righteous, we have to say the, the ground rule and the foundation of becoming a righteous person, of becoming a perfect person is first being a mensch. Right? I use the examples all the time about, the, about going to Sobeys and and that the you know the, per, the the that I'm waiting in line at Sobeys and you know let's say for up to ten items and there's someone in front of me with twenty and right, or, right, and and they don't seem to care but the the woman at the the woman who's at the register cares she doesn't want them there because it's they cause everyone else to take too long but she's working in the store she can't really reprimand a customer right the rest of the customers are getting frustrated this person thinks it's no big deal right because it's them but what happens is, is everybody's late because of it or the example that I use a lot is over at the at Chabad Chabad Gate there where you've got Right, uh, people, you have a parking lot, and people park in the fire lane yeah. to run in. Everyone says, ah, I, I only need to be here for a minute. I have to do a mitzvah. I have to buy my wife flowers for Shabbos. And they go and do that, and then you could have it with it very easily that absolutely nobody can get out because they're parked there. For sure, it's hard to get out, but there are times when nobody can go in or out of that plaza because some guy decided he wanted to buy, you know, Mishpacha magazine for Shabbos for his family, and because of it, Everybody else who's there is going to be stuck. Right? He's in a hurry because he doesn't want to be late for Shabbos, so all of us will be late for Shabbos because he parks in front of the exit. So that, that's an example. It doesn't say in the Torah, don't park in the fire lane. It doesn't say that. You have to be a mensch. That's the rule. Right? So that's what uh, the, uh, Rabbi Kamenetsky says. The Eile told us Noach. Who was Noach? Noach Ish. First, Noach was a mensch. Then he was at Sadiq, and then he was perfect, right? which are important, but he was a mensch first. And you see that in, in all of these occasions, when it talks about somebody extraordinary, it always refers to them first by their gender. And it's not really because he's a man or a woman. It means more so that he's, he, he is a disciplined, he is a, a genteel, sophisticated person who acts with you know, a certain amount of, uh, of courtesy to others. And that's what that's saying. But then it said, we, we asked the question, it says that he was righteous and complete in his generation. So we have to ask, does that mean if he was a different generation, would he not be righteous? Is he only righteous in his generation? On the one hand, his generation was corrupt. Right? They were terrible people. They were stealing from each other. They were so corrupt that they made the animals corrupt. Right? It, it affected the entire world. Things became corrupt. And, and, and here you have a guy in that generation who's righteous. So is it because in his generation was so bad, it was so hard to be righteous as telling you he's even greater than another person who's righteous? Because let's say in another generation where there's a lot of righteous people, it, maybe it's easier to be righteous. So he's the only one, maybe it's harder. Or maybe what you're saying is that in his generation he was righteous because compare him to everybody else, he is not so righteous, but he's more than everyone else, so we call him righteous. Right? In a regular generation where you have righteous people, he wouldn't be considered righteous. So which is the two? So Rashi brings both opinions, yes? What does it mean he was complete? Well, it, uh, complete usually means that he acts the same inside as outside. He is the same person inside himself as he is outside, right? He's, he's real. But, so, but here, so Rashi talks about this. Um, let's see. Um, so he says, 
he says, so, he says Marabu, same new shall the shvach. There are those people who say that the fact that he that Noah was considered righteous in his generation, that's a praise. The Torah is praising him. Kol shekain shi lo hayav bedor tzadikim. He imagine it, in his generation where everybody was evil, he was righteous. He would be even more righteous in a generation where everybody else was righteous. Imagine how great he would be. But yeh shador shim also l'genai. There are those who explain this statement that we just said as an insult. Why? The fidoro ay tzadik. He was a tzadik, but only because everybody else in his generation was so bad, he stood out as being good. But if he lived in the generation of Abraham, for instance, where there were better people, he'd be considered nothing. He was nobody. All right, so which of the two right, do we follow? So there's different opinions. Right? Uh, what this is trying to tell us? But well, one message that we can get from this is that Noah certainly was a complicated person, just like we are. He was not simple. Right? To say a person is a spendthrift, to say a person is is um, kind, to say a person is mean, is is really taking a person who has multifacets, many things about them, and just looking at one piece and saying that's the definition of this person. And of course it's never true. None of us are like that. We have times when we're not courteous. We have times when we go out of our way to be courteous. We have times when we are flamboyant with our money and we have times when we're cheap with our money. Every one of us. Right? So you can't say this person is X. I mean, there is a certain amount you might be able to see it, but in general, we're multifaceted. Noah also was. That in a generation where everybody was terrible, Noah stood out as being great. right? And, 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 and therefore, if he was in a generation where everybody was great, he might not have been as great. But he was great in his generation. That, that's on one hand. But there were also times in his life where, where Noah, no matter where he was, would have stood out as being great. Sometimes what he did that was great was, let's say, a B plus. And sometimes it was an A plus. Right? There were different parts of his life that he did differently, and he was. But in every single case, he was always better than the people around him. He always acted better. He was kinder. He had a better relationship with people, a better relationship with God than everyone around him. Sometimes it was exemplary, and no matter who you put him next to, he'd still be better. And sometimes it was just better than the bad. So you see from this that just like Noah is multifaceted, we are as well. And that we can't, when we judge people and we deal with people, we can't judge them very simply and say, this is how they are. They're just not nice. I don't want to be with them. It's just not, it's not the case. People are not nice one day. They're nice the next day. It can happen three times in one hour. They can change. It's uh, right. We try, try to help ourselves, but we all have bad days. We all have good days. And so here it shows us Noah does that as well. So then it goes on and, and, and it says that he walked with God. So here is the same argument. Did he walk with God? One opinion says, well, really, the only reason Noah was considered great was because really Noah was only better than the, than the low lives of his generation. Everybody in his generation were criminals. So he wasn't a criminal. Like It's like you know, a person who's born into a family where everybody in this family are hitmen. That's, their, right, that's what they do. The, the father, the mother, they're hitmen, and they had, they had jobs to kill people. And then they got married, and they had children, so they raised their children to be hitmen. But this one guy decides he's not going to be a hitman, he's just going to be a thief. <laughs> right? So in his family, he's a tzaddik, right? Because <laughs> he won't kill. That, that, so is that, that Noah is a tzaddik because he's living in a time when everyone's bad? So if you believe that, then when it says that God walks with Noah, so then you'd say, why does God walk with Noah? Because he has to support him. Because he can't support himself, right? Because if you see by Abraham, it says that Abraham walks before God. And, and that means that he walks on his own strength. Right? He doesn't need to be supported. On the other hand, if you want to say that, that the statement of Noah is that Noah was great, even though everybody else was bad, he was still great no matter where he was. So then you say walking with God shows you that God feels secure being with him, that they're together. Like, this is my friend. I can be with him. I don't have to worry about him. We, I don't have to walk in front of him to guard him or behind him to save him. I can walk with him. So you can understand the whole sentence both ways. So then it tells us he has three sons. He has Shem, Cham, and Yafes. So these three sons are um, examples of three children who are, who are perfect examples of their name describes who they are. And we hear about them later, of course, when they come out of the ark and what happens. But Shem, Cham, and Yafes, in this order, Shem means name. That's what the word means in Hebrew. Cham means hot in Hebrew. And Yafes means 
um, beautiful, from Yafe, right? Beautiful. And this is exactly what the essence of who they were. Now, uh, our understanding is that people in these days were not only very complicated, but they were very intense. And what came from these people were entire worlds. So you have, for instance, Shem means name. Right? We call God Hashem, the name. Because uh, Shem, what, is, what was Shem? Shem? The offspring of Shem were people who searched for and discovered the true God in the world. So we come from Shem. The Jewish people come from Shem. Cham, we're told, is, di is, is different. Cham is hot. That is, he's totally governed by his emotions, by his sens sensual desire, right? He gets, he's hot-headed, he gets angry easily, he's, he lusts easily, he's very emotional, and his emotions are so much in control of him that he can't necessarily always control himself correctly. And, um, and so he stands for those nations that, throughout history, like, like that acted in such a manner. That were people who were out of control. They, you know, the sensuality and sexuality and all of these things that went on within a person's lusts were things that they excelled at. They were hot. They're hot-blooded. Then you have the office, and the office means beautiful. And these were people who applied beauty to the world. Like an example would be the Greeks. The Greeks may have not. They may have been corrupted, but their goal was to bring philosophy into the world to raise the human spirit through human activity. So they had the best in sports, so they created the Olympics, and they created that idea of, of secular philosophy, like Aristotle and all of this. They have artwork, beautiful art they came up with. So their whole idea was to add a dimension to the world of beauty, and, and, and therefore the nations that followed, that came from him, took beauty very, very seriously, like the Greeks. Right? So do you find those are the three sons? And these, of course, these three sons go with Noah into the ark later on. And when they come out, the world is populated by people who come from these three sons and others. And these three, uh, those who come from these three sons are going to have these similar types of uh, character traits. And when later on, when Noah curses them, he curses them in the way that fits the personality. And when we get to it, we'll see. So. Now it tells us that the world is in a de very destructive place, and God comes to Noah and He tells him, "You have to build an ark." And uh, why? Because I'm going to destroy the world with water, and we're going to start over again. All of the people of the world are are terrible, and we're going to start over again. And I want you to—you're the only one with your immediate family who you have given them, you have brought them back to understand God, and to be honest. Um, they're going to continue, and the world will come from you. Everyone else will be destroyed. That's what, what he tells him. And he says, you have to build this ark, basically in the middle of a city, and you have 120 years to do it. And during that period, your goal is to reach out to all of the people around you who see you building an ark in the middle of a city and ask you, what are you doing with this giant ship in the middle? It's like building, it's like building the, you know, the, the allure of the seas. is the largest um, cruise ship right now. It's like... 7,000 people can go on this ship, right? They, the biggest ships most of people most have are like 3,500. This is like 7,000. This is enormous. They have guests to put on a ship. So you imagine him building a ship like this in the middle of his backyard. Right? He's building it like he buys a big yard and he builds, builds a ship for 120 years. Right? And his goal was that over the period of 120 years, he's supposed to reach out and convince people. We will say, Noah, what are you doing? What is that? And he says, I'm building an ark. Why? Well, God says, if the people of the world don't change, I'm going to destroy the world. So he had 120 years to convince people so that God wouldn't destroy the world. Then and it's a very odd idea because you imagine, well, why does God do this? He tells them, I'm going to make a flood, so you should make an ark. Now, okay, so God doesn't want to do more miracles than is necessary. He wants to keep things within the laws of nature. So if I'm going to flood the world, you need something to live. How do you live in a flood? You live in a boat. So you make a boat. But the boat itself, imagine as big as the boat was, it had to have two of every animal in it, at least. Right? Two of every single kind. It's in the, it had to be enormous, enormous. And it had to have you know, just a floor for, for like uh, garbage. Right? From, you know, from, from the animals and from the food and everything. And then you had the animals and you had the people. And it all had to be on this boat. Right? So it had to be an enormous, enormous thing. Well, it wasn't all that big. It was big for a ship, but it wasn't that big. And so it was miraculous already. So if God's going to make a, a tell them, build a ship, take 120 years to build a ship. And then, I'm going to, and then in order to make the ship work, he has to make a miracle. Why don't you just make a miracle in the first place and just say, here's the ship? 
right? Or here, every, everybody who I want to live is going to live. You're going to go to this island and it won't flood. You can stay there, yeah. right? He, 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 it's sort of like go through all this effort to do it in a natural way, and then he does a miracle anyways. So the point is, is that God wants to minimize miracles. God wants that, that the world should run according to a plan and that he should intervene into that world as, as, as rarely as possible. Not all the time, as rarely as he can. So the norm would be to build a ship, right? So he does. The fact that that ship couldn't hold everyone, so there he had to do a miracle. But he didn't have to do more miracles. He did as few as possible, yes? I understand that, uh, God, but God sent animals to him from because he didn't want to find kangaroos that are searching animals or in certain right. areas. So that was the miracle. Well, there was certainly a miracle in that they that the animals had a instinct to come to him, right? It was instinctual because animals don't talk. Right? They can't be. Right? He didn't go like like the guy in uh, was it called the uh, Mutual of Omaha's. See, remember that show? Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. It was on television when I was a kid. They didn't do that. Yeah. Uh, you're right. But but tsunami when it happened in 2004, they didn't find any one killed animal. The animals were feeling that something is going on, and they left to the safe place. Right. But it could be like this. It could be, but they, but something caused them to do it, right? So they, uh, they 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 didn't go to a safe place. They went to the middle of a city to Noah. Exactly. Right? How would they know that? That's that's not instinctual. Instinctual would be go to a mountain. Right, uh, an animal doesn't understand what it's doing. It just no, it feels the pressure change, so it runs away. It runs to a high place. Right, but um, to run to a middle of a city to an ark would definitely be unique. Right, they'd never do it again. You don't see them running to cruise ships whenever there's a tsunami. In so. fact, the a male and a female came. Correct. Right. So the whole thing was was miraculous. And and but but one way we have to wonder about it is imagine this. Let's make a scenario out of this. There is a outreach organization, right, that's created. And and we and we sit down, we make a board of directors and we say, Okay, we're gonna give you three hundred thousand dollars a year. We want you to reach out to everyone around you and, and educate them to what Judaism is, so that all the Jews should practice Judaism. So we want you to do this. So the first year goes and they're working for a whole year and they come up with, now they come to the board for the money for the next year. So the board says, how many people did you touch? How many people did you change? Well, nobody. You changed nobody? Uh, well, what do you want from us? Well, we want another $300,000 to do it again. So, okay, I mean, we're not going to close you down. The first year we had to buy all the computers and everything. So it was new. Let's try it again. So the second year comes and goes, and they say, okay, how did you do? Well, we didn't get anybody. You get anybody. What do you want? Well, we want the money again. Because every year you want money, you're not giving us anything. So eventually, of course, the board's going to say, we're closing you down. We're not going to, you know, uh, how are you going to operate? You operate three, four, five years without any success. But that's what Noah did. Noah went for 120 years. His job was to reach out to the people around him and to convince them that if you change and become a good person, that God won't destroy the world. Right? But he didn't ac accomplish it at all. He got no one. Absolutely nobody. He didn't do it. So, what, like, what is that? What, what, here he was, a righteous man. How is it that he didn't do it? So the commentaries tell us that one of the answers that, that it is that he was unable to do it, not that he not necessarily didn't try, is, is from the idea that we learn a little later. It tells us later that when it started to rain, it's right, it started to rain, it's in the Torah, it says that God had to push Noah to go into the ark. So you say, why, why would you have to push him? God tells him. It's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights, and the whole world's going to be flooded, and everybody in the world's going to be killed. And, build, and you build this ark so you can go in the ark and you'll live, right? So it starts to rain. What do you think he should do? He should go in the ark, right? But he doesn't go in the ark. God has to push him into the ark. So Rashi says that this is a message to us that Noah was of little faith. He didn't really believe God was going to do it. So, so how could that be? Noah is talking to God all the time. He spends 120 years of his life building a giant ship in his backyard. Right? His job is to get people who see the ship, who come to him and say, what are you building a ship for? Well, I'm building it because God's going to destroy the world unless you repent. And he didn't get anybody to repent. So like the whole thing sounds just so odd. So the, the, the point is, is that, that when we know that Noah didn't go into the ark, and he's called one of little faith. So we can say there's lots of reasons. It's not like he didn't believe in God. He talked to God. It's not like he didn't believe there'd be a flood. He knew there was going to be a flood. So why, why does he have little faith? Is that he basically probably believed something like that he couldn't accept that God was going to destroy every person 
Now, God would change his mind. God would, would have mercy on the people. He wouldn't actually do it, or he would scare them, and then he would do a miracle. But the fact that they actually, you know, didn't, uh, that, that, um, that God actually was going to go through with it, maybe he was of a little faith, right, in, in, on his level. And if that's the case, that he was like that, so that he didn't really believe it. He didn't really believe it was going to happen 100%, because he could say that maybe things will change. And if that's the case, now we know why nobody changed. Now he wasn't able to change people. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where was the scene where everything happened like this? In which place it happened? Where were they? Yeah. Where were they? Were well, we those? think that we were in. Uh, they call the the. Um, it was a a, a primordial triangle, um, in a, the Mesopotamia area of Mesopotamia. Yeah, because it was they found Ark on Mount Ararat. In Turkey. And that's right. where it ended yeah. up. Turkey. That's ended up. Right. And later on they descended to Babylonia. Yeah, well, that's the the valley. Yes. I mean, then it, like it says, Noah walked with God. Like you talked for a while, like he's righteous and right. perfect, and and then you. So it's not that he didn't believe there'd be a flood. He believed that God would have too much mercy to do it, oh. to actually kill everyone. So therefore, if that's the case. Because it, because it can't be they didn't believe it. Because he talked to God all the time. And he actually built the ark, right? He actually did it. But the fact was, he didn't have a total belief. And that's, that's why he failed in reaching people. Mm -hmm. Because one thing you learn when you want to try to help someone become exposed to Judaism and, and the good it is for them, or you want to get someone to stop smoking, or you want to get somebody to lose weight, or you want to get somebody to better their life, you know that, that it's not a simple thing to do because you're dealing with people's uh, psyche, their emotions. And when, if you go and you say the wrong thing, like, you know, if, uh, you see it all the time where some, you have somebody, a teenage girl will reach for a cookie and someone will say to her, you really think you need that? Well, that is so destructive and so horrible to say because, you know, she, she, of course she doesn't think she needs it. Nobody needs cookies, right? She's eating this cookie for whatever reason that she should or she shouldn't. But for someone to make a statement like that, one thing's for sure, you're not going to get them to go on a diet. That's not going to happen. You go to a person in the street who's smoking a cigarette and you say, don't you know smoking kills you? They're not going to stop just because you said that. The, the main reason that somebody's going to change is because they know you care about them. If, you, if they know you care about them, then they're going to listen to you. If not... They, they say, I'm just another, like, notch on his belt, notch on his gun, right? You, you got another one. You got, I got another person quit smoking because of me. Another person did this because of me. Another person became religious because of me. And then I always tell people, if you want to try to reach out to someone, and you have, at the step one is, make sure you know the person's first name, their wife's name, and their children's names. Until you know that, you don't even know enough to start the conversation. Because you can't reach out to somebody unless that person knows you care about them and they won't know you care about them unless you care about them if you don't know anything about them you can't care about them so care about people then you'll be able to help change them and that's the problem with Noah since Noah didn't totally buy that this was going to happen he was of small faith so then he couldn't change anyone so the end result was they all died they all died and that's why this is referred to as the flood of Noah because as it was his fault because he could have stopped it, yes. So, Robert Rothman, like in 120 years, it, it would have rained, like a day like today. We don't know that the rain is going to stop tonight or it's going to continue for another... Correct. But we also know nobody so can't... How, how can't would you? Noah have known that this was the start? Like it's raining and he's, he's maybe doing that, a little building in a drizzle and then it rains the next day. Right. So I had that point, question too. Um, I, like, not that he didn't believe that God would do it. He just didn't know that this was it. Maybe it was, maybe the the rain that would flood the world is going to start next week, because God doesn't tell him what day it's going to start. But when God spoke to Noah and said, I, I think he did. I'm not sure. Like it's time to go into the, into the ark. It's time to go inside. Right. Would that be an indicator that? This is it. This is well, yeah, but the point was is that the fact that he had to say that is the indication that he didn't do it on his own, mm -hmm. and he should have known it. And so there must be that, like, for instance, it wouldn't surprise me if you would say to me that you saw a medrash that said that for 120 years it didn't rain until the flood. Right? In other words, there would be some way that Noah would know, reasonably know, that the rain had started, the, 40, the rain had started mm -hmm. for the 40 days. That's it. Right? For him, because otherwise you can't say that he was at fault for not going in, because it'd be like you said, it's going to rain. It rains today. It doesn't mean we're going to have a flood. Right? 
So that just because a guy, if God would actually come to this room and he'd say to us, okay, it's going to start, it's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights, and the whole world's going to get flooded. But, but it doesn't mean that this is the rain. Maybe it'll start next mm -hmm. week or in two weeks. Mm -hmm. I've been waiting 120 years, right? 120 years is a long time. How do I know this is it? But I'm not exactly sure. But it, it must be there was some way he knew. Otherwise, they couldn't have been critical of him. And they were. Yes? Um, it, it doesn't sound like his other two sons, like Ham and Yafis, were very, you know, um, good people, like the way you describe them. Like, I, I know it sounds terrible, but he, why would he, like, you know, if he had this view, they're all corrupt. Is but it not the same with these? He didn't sons? believe that his children were corrupt. I mean, God didn't either, otherwise, he wouldn't have saved them. Um, but, but, but what we see is that that people then were much more the personalities and how they their spiritual DNA is handed over is much more intense than ours is today it, because they were from the original people so that you know that you could have a character trait in Ham that's so strong that it'll carry for 500 generations while a character trait that you and I have right not necessarily would do that it's not necessarily so strong and in them it was uh, it was sort of like these were the first people everything came from them so the so their personality traits and the things that they did affected everybody in the world or at least a third of the world for each one of them so the so that's how we see it but for instance we see in that later on when we get to the story of noah being drunk when we see how do they react to it and that's how you see their personalities we'll get to it you'll see um, so now they have the flood, right? And we go through this, the, this, the, the whole thing with the flood. Well, why, would he, so why would he want just Jewish people? Like, you know, they, well, they weren't Jewish. They weren't Jews until after they came out of Egypt. Oh, I know. Like, but there were people who believed in God. Shem, like from Shem's... Uh, you know. Well, Shem, just because of his personality, the people who came from him are the ones who are going to look for, for uh, meaning in life. Just, that's just how they were. Well, the, you, you know how you can meet some people who are always, they're like interested in philosophy and why am I here and what am I doing here? And they have other people who just want to party. And one's not right, one wrong, one wrong. It's just they're different. So that's how they were there. Each one of them, uh, you know, the enthusiasm of Ham, the heat of Ham, could make a person an extremely righteous person with great emotion and, and real passion in life. But while um, Yafes, the beauty that Yafes uses, could be, make a person a wonderful, special, righteous person, but it also can lead them astray. Right? Okay. The, the intellectualism and the pursuit of religion, of shame, could, could push you to practice other religions right, rather than just the, the correct one. So there are, the, each one is not an answer, it's a path. And you can follow that path for good or bad, depending on how you do it. So, so now you have. Um, all right, Noah going into the into the flood into the ark, and he goes through it for 40 days. So, I mean, the the general idea we know, but there are a couple of interesting points. Like for instance, God tells Noah that he should put a window in the ark. That the ark has to have a window in it, right? And and it's an odd thing. Like, what's the purpose? But what's what is he looking at? Always looking at as a world filled with water, and every person he's met, other than his immediate family, are dying. So what does he got to look at? And he, at, the, at the most he'll see is people dying. The worst he'll see is water everywhere. So what does God want him to have a window for? So here the commentaries tell us that the, that in a med, in sort of a sort of a drush or in a, like a person would give a speech, we would understand that not in the literal sense, but one of the ideas of the window is that a window is the ability for a person to be able to look outside of themselves. Now you can be in a house, for instance, and in your house there could be all kinds of arguments going on right now. And you can look out the window and see your neighbors, and it looks like there everyone's at peace there. Right? Or you could have a lot of peace in your house and look out and see people fighting in the street. Right? They're not uh, your your house is, is your place, but you have a entry into the rest of the world now by looking through a window. And that's what the ark was. Yeah, Noah lived inside of this self contained world that God wanted him to go in, and that was the ark. But even while he's in there, it was necessary for him to be able to see outside and see what was happening. Because Noah needed to have an understanding that he was re had a responsibility to try to change the people of the world who all died. They, were all, they all died. Can you imagine that someone comes to you and they say, there's going to be a plague. And everyone who doesn't take this pill that I'm, gonna, I'm going to give you is going to die. 
and you and you know I'm right. It's not like a crazy person coming to you. You know I'm right, and I give you 10 million pills, and I say all you got to do is give these out to 10 million people. You'll save their lives. Give them the pill and tell them to take it, and and you don't. You don't do it. So well, why didn't you do it? You 10 million people you could have saved. You didn't do it. That's Noah. That's what happened with Noah. Noah was a tzaddik. He was righteous. He was close to God. But he was but he he was righteous for himself. He didn't care about the rest of the world, so to speak. He didn't do anything to help them. A hundred and twenty years he had to try to change the world. He didn't change a single person. Not one person. So you see that that the idea of the window was for him to be able to see that you can't seclude yourself from the rest of the world and think you'll be fine. You won't be fine. You won't work that way. Right? There's a, a famous Gomorrah we've talked about before, where I talked about the destruction of Jerusalem. And it says in the destruction of Jerusalem, right, so it says that um, God uh, is in, in heaven, he's talking to the angels, and he tells the, an the angel of death, I want you to go to Jerusalem, and I want you to um, kill everybody, except for the righteous. The righteous Jews, right, not all the Jews, some of the Jews were not righteous. They should all, they should be killed. There's going to be a war, they're going to be killed. I want the angel of death to kill them all, except for the righteous Jews. So it says that an angel comes to God and says, the angel of truth comes to God and says, no, you can't do that. He said that you have to kill the righteous too. So God says, what do you mean kill the righteous? They didn't do anything wrong. And he says, yes, they did. Well, what did they do? They didn't reach out to the others who weren't righteous to try to lead them the right way. And God says, yes, but... If they had reached out, I'm God. I know they wouldn't have been successful. It wouldn't have happened. They would not have changed them. So the angel says back, well, God, you know, but they didn't know. And they didn't try. And therefore, God said, you're right. And he, and there was a, supposed to be, he was supposed to put a sign on their head that they were righteous so they shouldn't be killed. And he said, don't do it. And they killed everybody. Um, the point being that the righteous are responsible for the others. It's not a nice thing to do. You're responsible, right? You have to do this. If you don't do it, you're not righteous. That's his, the point. And that's the same thing with Noah. No, no, when it says that Noah was righteous in his generation, so we now can understand it in a different way. We can understand that Noah was righteous by himself, right? Because he took himself away from everybody. <coughs> But he was only in, his, only in his generation when everyone was bad and he didn't make a difference in the world, right? So he was not so strong. He was, they, there's a famous expression that comes from Noah, which is he was called a tzaddik in pelts. And that's a Yiddish expression. It means a tzaddik in a fur coat. A tzaddik in a fur coat is, it means like I'm sitting in the house and everybody's cold. And you say, oh, I'm so cold. I want to, put, I want to go make a fire, right? They didn't have furnaces. I go put wood in the fire. And I say, what do you need to waste wood for? I'm not cold. So of course you're not cold. You're wearing a fur coat. You're so righteous. You don't want to use the wood, right? Because you're, you're, you're wearing a fur coat. The rest of us have no coat, right? You're such a big deal. That's Noah. Noah, right, he had it nice. He had his house. He had his family. He didn't have to worry about anybody. He was righteous. But he was righteous right, without taking consideration what was going on around him. Right, and that's really what his his flaw was. So now they come out. <clears throat> God causes the water to go down, and, they, and it's time to come out of the ark. And they come out, and the first thing it says that Noah does is that he plants a vineyard. Right? So this is already a, an odd thing. The commentaries ask, is there anything wrong with Noah planting a vineyard? No. He comes out, everything's destroyed. Right. So how did he get a vine? Right? He must have had it on the ark in the first place, because everything was destroyed. So he takes this vine and he plants it in the ground. He makes a vineyard, and and then he takes the vine from the vineyard that makes grapes. He makes wine, and then he takes the wine. And he drinks the wine. And he gets drunk. Right? That's what happened. So the commentaries say there's nothing wrong with him baking a vineyard. Right? It's a, uh, wine is an important thing. He has to make something. Right? If he did, so let him make wheat. Let him make something else. He decided to make wine. So the commentaries say that's why later on. He, he's referred to as Ish Adama, the man of the land. First he's called Ish Tzadik. He was a righteous man. Then he's called the man of the land. Why? Because it's not that he did anything wrong. Nothing wrong with planting a vineyard. Right? He, could, he, had, he could have planted anything. But it was his timing was bad. 
he, right, because he prioritized planting the vineyard. Because remember this, when Noah goes into the ark, what is he doing in the ark? His entire life in the ark is taking care of other people. All he does is feed people, feed animals, take care of the animals, take care of the people. That's all he does all the time for 40 days. He's giving, 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 giving. Right? He's learning how you are a tzaddik. A tzaddik gives, right? cares for people, does things for people. So if he really integrated that within himself, as soon as he gets off the ark, what should he do? He should plant food for people. Right? That's what he should do. He should plant wheat. Go plant wheat so that you can feed people. People are going to starve. No, I'm going to make grapes so I can have wine and I'm going to get drunk. Right? So here, he's not doing anything wrong. Right? It's not wrong to plant grapes. But, he's, but it's showing you who he really is. He really isn't a giver. He really does not have a lot of interest in other people. He is only cared about himself. And therefore, what originally we would have said that he had, God taught him the lesson of giving, 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 because he didn't do it in 120 years. He didn't learn the lesson. Right? So now he's drunk. And this is where the whole story of the, of the brothers comes in. So they're, now they're, they're, all, they're all drunk. He's drunk. And, and, his, um, and his son... Um, uh, uh, his son comes and he sees him, right? Shame comes, he sees him, and he's uh, he's naked, and he's dead drunk. So he goes back to tell his brothers, you know, you, you're not going to believe this. Our father is laying drunk on the ground outside. So they come back. So it says that when they came back, they co came back with a cloak, a coat to cover their father because he was naked and it was embarrassing. So first it says that. When they came back, it says that shame walked backwards, so he shouldn't see his father naked, and uh, and it says that Khamenei office did not, right? So um, when later when the we know that some there was some interaction with Ham. We're not sure exactly what it is. The commentaries say that Ham either had had some type of sex act with his father, or Ham castrated his father. There, but something happened between them. Um, they, they would say he castrated his father because he said there's already three sons, right? We have to split up the world. There's not enough for us as it is. If you have more kids, we're going to have to split it up even further. So he made it so he didn't have more kids. The other one is that he had a homosexual act with his father because he was Kham. He was totally, that was his life. He was so full of this type of thing that he acted on his father who didn't have the ability to stop him. Whatever it was, so now he's awake now, and he's going to say something to his kids, and he curses them. And he says that shame will be blessed, because shame came and covered me and didn't, didn't humiliate me. Right? It says, Yafes, who accompanied shame, but didn't walk backwards, who saw me naked, right, humiliated me, but cared for me. And Ham did something, we don't know exactly what, that was negative. So it says, shame will be blessed. It says that Yafes... Right, who is who stands for beauty? He will become successful and he will create a world, but he will be mostly successful when he subjugates himself to shame. That is, the difference between beautiful art and pornography is when Yafes subjugates himself to those who have religious morality. So then, art with religious morality can make beautiful art. Art with no morality makes pornography. Right, it makes violent art. Right, makes the wrong art on the wrong things. Right, so therefore, you, you, Yafes, you, you, if you put yourself into the tent of shame, you will make beautiful things, just like you accompanied shame. But you need to subjugate yourself to him. You have to feel that he's in charge, because if you think you're in charge, you'll make pornography. You'll make ugly art, art that is without morals. But with him, you won't. What will you do when you're with him? You'll make a beautiful talis bag. You'll make beautiful crowns for the Torah. You'll make you know, esrog holders. You'll make beautiful art of positive things rather than of violent and sexual things all the time. So that was what Yafis says. Chamet says is cursed, and and um, and it says that you know, he was given a, like a like a horrible curse. All right, him and his family, and um, and they will be slaves to their brothers. It says. So that's what ends up to the, with them, and each one. Right, will carries these characteristics into the generations that follow, and of course they're diluted as they goes on generation after generation. And today, because of a number of things that happened in the areas of the prophets, we don't really know who's who anymore. We don't know who comes from where. We know certain things, like you know that the Jewish people or the Semites, right, who are not an original people, right? They, we weren't one of those three sons, right? That we were from shame. 
so too are the Arabs are from Shem. They're Sem Semitic like us. They come from Shem. We know that, that um, Ethiopia comes from Khan. We don't know today that the people who are from Ethiopia are the same ones, but originally they were. We know that the original Greeks were from Yafes, but the Greeks today and the Greeks of then are not necessarily the same. They've, a lot of it's changed. So we see that there were certain people like that, but a lot of it's changed. So, um, so now when he, he comes out and he, after he curses them, Right, then it gives us this whole lineage of, fam of people that came from them and who they were and who had which children. And, and if you read the names of all the children, some of them are sort of famous and you know, you know why they came from, who they came from. Like you've got Nimrod, who is a famous warrior right, who fights Asaph later on in history. And Nimrod was a, a, an adulterer, a murderer. He was a dictator with absolutely no morality. And he came from Ham, which makes sense. Uh, you can see it right here in the lineage of how that happens. But there's, um, uh, just to let's finish off with one more, there's really many things to discuss about this um, whole idea. But one of the things it tells us is that at one time it says that, that Noah was going to feed the animals. Right? So he goes into the bottom. The, the bottom of the ark was for the refuse and the garbage, and the next level was for the animals, and the next was for the humans. So he goes down to where the animals are, and he's feeding them, and it says that the lion bites him because he didn't feed him quick enough. Right? The lion was hungry, and Noah comes close, so the lion bites him, either to be because he's angry or because he wants to eat him. But he bites him. Right? And so the commentary is, I'll say, what is this Medrash telling us? What is the message of this Medrash? And it says that the, 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 the idea is Noah was doing a good thing. Without Noah, that animal would be dead. Right? There'd be no more lions in the world if it wasn't for Noah. And that, and that specific animal would certainly be dead. So for the Medrash to tell us that he, the lion bit him shows that he's, that he's ingratious. Right? He's an ingrate. He has no appreciation. Of course, he's an animal, but he has no appreciation. Um, so therefore, since an animal doesn't have this idea, so what was the message to Noah? And here is the message of what we call Zrizis, of doing something well and fast. I don't mean overly fast. Uh, you know, we have a, there's an idea in the Torah that says that when you have a mitzvah to do, don't allow it to get stale. Do the mitzvah right away. So you'll notice that mo very often when we have mitzvahs, we do them right at the first possible time. Lulu of an esrog is that you do in the daytime, Right? So right away in the morning we do Lulav and Esrog. A bris is on the eighth day. It has to be during the daytime. So right away in the morning you do a bris. You don't do a bris at four in the afternoon. You do it at eight in the morning. Right? All, any mitzvah that comes to you, you should do it right away. That's called zrizus, which means with speed, with enthusiasm. You're not doing it fast. You don't do a fast bris. But you do the bris soon. Right? That's the idea. Right? So the, 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 the same thing was here. He, he took his time. He decided, you know, yeah, he says to the, to the lion, what, what are you complaining about? I'm feeding you for free. You're living in my boat for free. I saved your life for free. And you're telling me that I, didn't, I should have been here at 12 o'clock with your lunch and I'm here at 1230 and you're complaining to me? Right? That's, that, Noah thinks like that, so the lion bites him. Because you're not supposed to think about the other person's responsibility to you. What we have to think is what our responsibilities are to him. His, his no responsibility to the lion was to take care of the lion. The fact that the lion was an ingrate and the lion bit him, right, whatever it is, that, that, that's not Noah's worry. Noah's worry is I have to do my job. And this is what happens with people all the time. Whenever if ever I have to intervene in, a, in the personal issues between people, which I try not to because it has very little to do with the shul, um, but, but when it happens, Right? It usually happens be, in, in the following way. Something happens between two people who like each other, right? who get along with each other, and one of them is offended. Right? So the one who's offended usually is offended because the other person was, was unthinking. Right? They weren't feeling. So, so if you go to the person who, who um, caused the offense, and you tell them, so they're going to say, what are you so upset about? I did this, and I did this, and I, I invited them to my house. I gave them a meal. I was very nice to them at my meal. And he didn't, and, and he's insulted because I made him sit near the kitchen. Like, that's, he's insulted about. Right, so what's wrong with that answer? They're pro they could be right. It could be that this person is like a pain in the neck. Right? And so he gets upset at everything. But the fact is, you're looking at it wrong. 
you have you or that person and uh, meaning all of us as well when we have a, have to deal with another person we can't say we expect them to do their responsibility we have to say we have to do our responsibility and we hope they do theirs but if they don't do theirs we can choose to not come again or not do it again but you can't say because they're not doing what they're supposed to I can do whatever I want because they they got you know because they got let's say you know I gave them I brought them to my house and I gave them a meal and they don't like where I put them I put them near the kitchen but right? they should say thank you for the meal and forget that for me of the kitchen well that's true they should but that's not your job your job is to make sure that you bring someone to your house you treat them with respect and you treat them nicely clearly they're not happy so fix it even if it's not your fault even if they're being they're going too far because you are think about yourself don't think about the other person's responsibilities because as soon as we start thinking about the other person's responsibilities we fight with everybody because everybody you should have done this and you should have done that what what do you mean you're upset with me how dare you be upset with me how many times that I could I have been upset with you and I didn't and well the, what do you mean I've been such a terrible person you're upset with me so many times right this could go up and escalate so the idea is, is that when we have a problem with someone if we think about our responsibility to them regardless of their responsibility to us that problem will usually dissipate it'll usually go away but as soon as we start thinking about the other person's responsibilities to me, then we have the problems. And that's the lion in Noah. <clears throat> Noah says, who are you to complain? I'm feeding you. I'm taking care of you. I saved your life. So if I'm a half hour late with your food, what are you, what are you complaining about? Noah's right. He's right. But all he's going to do is antagonize the lion. So the lion bit him. Instead, Noah should realize my responsibility is to take care of him. He has nowhere else to go. I brought him in here. I saved him. I have to take care of him. I have to feed him. I don't. He shouldn't have to be hungry. That's what Noah should be thinking about. The fact is, he wasn't. He was thinking about what the lion should do for him. Now, you should be tolerant. You should wait. You shouldn't be upset. But you see it with volunteers. Sometimes somebody volunteers for something. Right? And I'm not thinking of anybody in particular. But, but it, this happens is that as you say, okay, I need someone to come in and type letters for me. So they do, and then there's like five spelling mistakes in each letter. So they're useless, right? I can't use the I can't use the letter. They meant well. They wanted to do it and they wanted to help and they really did mean well. But what happens when they do that and the, and the letters are useless? So I go back to them and I say that these letters are typed wrong. They say, "What do you want? I'm a volunteer." Well, you volunteer, you just wasted my paper, my time, your time. What what good is it? But in other words, when you're a volunteer, you have to think don't think about how I'm supposed to treat you as a volunteer. Think about what you're trying to do. You're trying to make these letters so I can send out thank you letters to people. That's what you're trying to do. So if you want to do it, do the best you can. But don't tell me what do you want, I'm doing it for nothing. Because that's that's what I'm getting then, it's nothing. Right? We do that, right? we all do that when it comes to volunteering. What do you mean that I didn't do it the way you wanted? I did it for free, what do you want from me? Right? I did it the way I wanted. But I needed it this way, not that way. Right? So it's the same thing. Right, the, the, how this is understood in, in the world we live in is the difference between responsibilities and rights. In Canada, we have rights. Right? You have a right, right? like I know the Americans have a right for happiness. They have different words here. Right? They have a, a right for the pursuit of happiness. They have rights, and they can hold you to their rights. And if you, if you do something to their rights, they can sue you for it. Right? That's how it works. In Judaism, we don't have rights because what we have is responsibilities. It's not that you have a right to be happy. I have a responsibility to make you happy. It's not your right. It's your right to make me happy. I mean, it's your responsibility to make me happy. It's my responsibility to make you happy. My responsibility, not your right. And therefore, as soon as it's your right, then you're always thinking about the other person. That other person has to do this for me. If you think about your responsibilities, I have to think about what I have to do for you. Now, if I'm thinking about what I have to do for you, and we're all thinking about what we have to do for each other, everybody has everything done, and everybody feels like they're giving, and they're happy. But as soon as you have response, everything is rights, then it's, I'm taking. You, you must give me money. It's my right to get this money. Right? It's not, and, that's, and that's, in Judaism, is not, considered, is not good. We don't believe that that's the right way to do things. Rather, not that people don't have rights, they do, but we look at it as our personal responsibilities. I'm responsible to take care of the poor. Right, that's my job. I have a responsibility. We all do to, to, to help take care of the poor. Right? That's the, 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 does the poor person have a right for money? No, no right on my money. It's my money. I have a responsibility to take care of them. 
right? If all they think about is their rights, they're not going to get anywhere. But if, they th- but if I think about my responsibilities, I'll be able to help people. And that's what the Noah and the lion teaches us. I didn't get to talk about the Tower of Bavel. I will talk about it on Shabbos for those who are here. Um, because the Tower of Bavel is also an amazing thing. Um, but I don't want to keep you over. So there's a lot there. All right, we'll meet again next week. We'll be doing Lech Lecha. And I hope that uh, if you have any, any points or things you want to discuss specifically, we're always glad to do it. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Rabbi, you, you talked about, you know, the person inviting somebody over to sit, you know. It, it, Thanks for coming, it, Patty. It's nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. It's not, it's not exactly the same as the other ones, right? Because how can you, like, like, it, like, did, like, did you know the person was upset where they sat while the dinner was happening? Or, or like, when you say, how can I fit everybody in? Or I have other, you know, yeah, like... Oh, but those are questions of reality. Yeah. So you just have to, uh, because so you this do. is an example. We're only giving examples. We have to presume that the realities are fine. But, yeah, there could be other ulterior like, reasons, right? There could be ulterior reasons, like I only have room for four. Yeah. And you showed up with an extra child. I don't have room for a fifth. So I have to, I have to do what I can. So you're going to be cramped. And then you're going to get upset because you're cramped. But you're only cramped because you brought an extra person. But I have to not think of it that way. I have to say, yeah. I have five people in my house who are expecting a meal and to be treated with dignity. I have to do the best I can. Yeah. That's what I think about. I don't think about how dare you bring an extra person to my house. And then what, then oh. what happens is I make a fight out of it. Nobody's happy. But if the, if the guy's hurt and, and you, you, know, you did the best, you feel you did the best you can, you, you think, would you say, oh, you should apologize to the other Man, like if if, hurt, if you're you at my house and I did so, and something me. hurt was hurt you right you're at my house you are at my house yeah. and something upset you yeah. right and I know that I didn't do anything yeah. normal to upset you yeah. right but you're overly you sensitive did, about something yeah, and I did, don't know you did right? everything you could let's say so I am not responsible to to uh, ask you to forgive me but if I do it it's a good thing to do.